next set of students that comes through. And that's what this invitation and what this space is all about. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Josh here. He's going to talk a lot about his program, or a little bit about his program. And uh, I will let you do. Go for it. All right. Thank you. Care. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? Hey. Yeah? Hey. I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joshua Caleb Collins, and I'm the founder and CEO of Catapult. Uh, and I just wanted to thank the Phillips Academy for having me tonight and to kick off your Nest Ed uh, chats for the year. It's really exciting to be here. And, and a lot of what I'll talk about today are things that I wish someone would have told me when I was in high school. And that's all largely actually why Catapult was created. And if, Catapult, if I had Catapult when I was in high school, my life might look very, very different than it does today. Um, and so before we dive into things, um, I'd love to get a sense for the room and, and kind of why everyone showed up, what people are interested in. I'd like to start with how many of you watch Shark Tank? All right. It's a good amount. All right. How about how many of you had a lemonade stand when you were younger? About the same percentage. All right. All right, how many people are currently working on startup ideas or problems that they're looking to solve in the community? That's awesome. That's like 15, incredible. Uh, this is great. All right, so uh, for me, I, I grew up in Minnesota. Do we have any Minnesotans here? Any boarders that are Minnesotans? Okay. Um, so in Minnesota, I went to school about 2,000 people and uh, here you guys have a lot of different activities, and I'd love to get a feel for how many of you uh, maybe shared the same as activity as I did. So do we have anyone in National Honor Society? Is that even at this school? Mm. Good to know about. Looks like I win that category. Uh, how about track and field? All right. How about uh, volunteering and service? Okay, very cool. How about basketball players? Handful? All right, we got some maybes. Uh, softball or baseball? All right. How about student government, student council? Football? Do you guys have? All right. Sweet. Who wants to take a guess? I'll take two guesses on what the last one is. It's not another sport. I wish my school had entrepreneurship. Oh, it didn't have robotics either? It's crazy. All right, I heard someone say music, and I was in orchestra. Do we have any orc dorks in the room? All right. Yeah. Sorry, self-identified here. My mom was an orchestra teacher for 39 years, so um, started really young. So I don't know about you guys, but for me, high school was kind of crazy. Like, you felt like, for me, I felt like this, like a hamster on a wheel going like a million miles an hour don't have much control over your schedules, wish you could kind of break free from the treadmill of life, but sometimes the treadmill only gets faster and faster and faster. Any of you can, can kind of relate to that? <laughs> Everyone? <laughs> so for me in high school though, another thing, outside of having like a crazy schedule where you get up at six in the morning, you go until like nine or 10 at night, and just repeat the whole thing 180 days a year, I also felt a lot of pressure, uh, a lot of pressure to perform, a lot of pressure that was put on me by the cultural situation, my peers, uh, family, and even myself. Uh, and a lot of times I felt like this guy in Houdini's water chamber, just completely like trapped by all this pressure. Uh, and unfortunately, I also didn't have a lot of outlets to fail. And so when I did fail or not do as well, it also took its toll. Do any of you kind of, can any of you relate to this kind of pressure? Yeah really sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, who feels like, I'm curious, just who feels like you have a, a safe space to fail here, whether it's school, sports, music, uh, theater, <laughs> math, all right. How about you? Here in the maker space? Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so for me, here is my plan and why I went to high school. Um, and, and for me, I went to high school because I wanted to go to college. 
I wanted to learn really awesome things while I was in college, and then get a job, and then hoping to get a job to make some money, and ultimately to make some money to take care of my family, maybe go on fun vacations, and just live a good life. Does anyone, this was my plan in high school. It was a little subtle, I didn't think of it every day, but at the, when I thought about like, why am I working so hard to go to college? Why am I going to college? Why do I need to get a job? Does anyone, is this a similar plan that any of you had? This is pretty awesome. So we were similar when I was in high school. It looks like the times haven't changed too much. Um, and so for me, I continued to execute my plan. So I, I moved from Minnesota to sunny Santa Barbara, went to a very small school called Westmont College, 1,200 students. This is our view from the library. Um, and I was crushing it at college. I was studying three different degrees. I was doing the decathlon and track and field and just loving it. And then all of a sudden, my plan got completely annihilated. All right, well, some of my last questions here. Any procrastinators in, in here? Yes. <laughs> all right, all right, here's the last one. Any, any good BSers? Here we go. So the reason I asked those two questions is that's actually how I started my first startup. No, truly. I procrastinated on a marketing assignment. The library was closed. I couldn't do a case study. So I had to make up my own product. My professor said, oh, this is a pretty good idea. Made an introduction. Two weeks later, I had incorporated. Having no idea what I was doing. Uh, and then I tried to figure it out. That first startup was called studentvolunteer.com. Uh, what we did was we digitized the volunteer tracking system. So back when I was in high school, I don't know what you guys do here, but we had sheets of paper that we had to bring to places and have someone sign it. Now, can you imagine 2,000 sheets of paper for one person multiple times a year, probably 10,000 sheets, and have the, have the pain of having to bring it there? So we digitized it, and this was back in 2009 and 2010 that we were using SMS technology and emails. And then we generated revenue through something called volunteer impact rewards. So if you volunteered five hours, you get a free uh, Dairy Queen blizzard. Or maybe if you did 20 hours, you get free tickets to the Sox game. Uh, and so that was my first company. It was incredible. We got funding. We were building a team. We had an incredible plan. And you guys want some insider information? Be careful with insider information. This one's safe. I had no idea what I was doing most of the time. And it was kind of crazy. I was like, are you sure you want to give me all this money? Are, are you sure you want to partner with us? And for me, you know, after about three years, we actually, like 90% of all companies, we actually failed. And this for me was a huge blow because all of a sudden, I didn't do what everyone else around me did. I was the only one from my school, from my university, that didn't go and get like a real job. I used all my savings and invested in this company. I took, I had other people's money. I had to let go of my friends. And so it was this period that really, really was hard for me. And I had never been in a space both where my plan completely was obliterated and I completely failed. And I didn't know for a while, like, man, like at the time, it, like this really sucks. Like I have no, like what good could ever come from this? I was sitting in my parents' basement in the middle of Minnesota in February and life just sucked. And then a couple weeks passed from when we decided to make the closure of um, studentvolunteer.com and a partner colleague of I called me up and was like, hey, I want you to move to New York and I want you to work for us. Not only do I want you to work for us, but I want you to be one of four vice presidents helping me lead this organization. And I was like, are you sure? I'm 25. I just completely blew up my company. I have no idea how to start a company. And this is where I would say one of the biggest learnings came from me. And that was all my failures, all the things that I felt like I really sucked it up at, all the things that I was like just really down about, were actually really, really good. And it was the one thing that actually differentiated me from other people is that I had all of this experience. I'd made all these mistakes, and because I had made all these mistakes, I wasn't gonna continue making the same ones. And that started to be my competitive edge. And all of a sudden, this plan of my life that was completely on fire 
shift it, and I used it to my, you know, to be to my advantage. All of a sudden, I started to, you know, have opportunities come up that I never could have planned for, and then I started to change my plan of life to more of a whiteboard, something that I could change a little bit easier, that I wasn't stuck to, and wouldn't be so painful to have to throw out. Um, and so those are some big learnings for me. And for me, like growing up, I felt this pressure around having to like have a plan, having to be perfect, having to execute that. But through this entrepreneurial experience, through trying to start this company, it gave me this insight. It taught me things around you know rapid collaboration with team members, how to how to iterate on an idea and a problem, how to use empathy and the importance of empathy. And I noticed that these skills that I learned through all these mistakes and this experience or what actually were giving me the competitive edge to let my career really take off. So for me, the next step was I had an opportunity, an amazing opportunity to join a global nonprofit called Ashoka as their entrepreneur in residence for Ashoka's youth venture. And Ashoka pioneered the space of social entrepreneurship. It was an incredible opportunity. And once again, I got that opportunity because of my past. Um, and for me, it was great because I had the opportunity to work with young and with old entrepreneurs, helping them get their ideas off the ground. And this is where I came across with three really big ideas that I took away from that process. And I think it's really applicable for you because entrepreneurship can be something that's pretty daunting. When you guys think about starting a company, do you guys have this assumption that it's going to take a ton of work and I just don't know if I can start one? Yeah, it's really daunting to even take that first step. And so what I found out, though, is that everyone can be what I like to call a solution catalyst. Some other people might call this a problem solver, and some other people call it an entrepreneur. But it's really, really cool that if you just take three principles, first is being curious about solving a problem. The second is being willing to experiment on solving that problem. And then the third is the, having the tenacity to embrace failure, take that failure, and implement it into the new idea. That's all it really takes to be a solution catalyst. And the really cool thing about solving problems and being an entrepreneur is it's just like playing a sport or practicing for music. The more you practice, the better you become, and the easier it is to hit your target. And I think it's really, really important to know that because you know, for us, when we have these big daunting like goals, we're like, oh, I can never do that. It's just too big. It can kind of prohibit us from practicing. And the third thing is that age just doesn't matter. And that the earlier you start trying to practice being an entrepreneur, trying to practice solving problems, the more prepared you're going to be at solving those bigger problems later on that approach you. And so those three things. One, that everyone can be an entrepreneur. Two, that practice makes it better and gives you the skills to really accomplish big problems and that your age doesn't matter are really important things that like, when I was in high school, I just wouldn't have really thought of, wouldn't have really believed. But after my time of like, working with entrepreneurs all ages, I really saw that. And where it really hit home for me is when I started working with this guy. And this is actually my younger brother, Chris. So he was in high school about three and a half, four years ago. And he had an idea for a startup. But he was really, really struggling with these three things. One, even though he was in high school, people treated him like a little kid. Does anyone else, can anyone relate to that? Yeah. The second was, he didn't have access to these amazing resources that most startups need, from legal help to design, uh, to great mentors to help guide them. And then the third is he didn't have a tribe, he didn't have a community of like-minded people to help do this with. It's really, really lonely if you don't have other people around you. And so based on these three things, we decided to create Catapult to invest in the future uh, game changers, change makers, and business disruptors. We select the world's most promising young entrepreneurs from across the country, across the world even, to participate in our three-month intensive immersive startup incubator. And in that incubator, you learn these fundamental skills, and more importantly, this mindset about what is it about entrepreneurship that's going to help you solve problems now, like right now, but then also in the future. And so for us, we've, um, just to quickly go through kind of the last two and a half years, we've had 10 cohorts. We've had 
Over 300 students participate from 38 states and seven countries. And collectively, they've generated over $3 million. Isn't that kind of nuts? But the stat I love the most is that 70% of them have gone on to start their second company. They've taken this mindset, they've taken these tools that they've learned at Catapult, and they've gone on to start something different. They've built upon that knowledge that they have. For us, it really comes down to not just about launching a startup, it's about launching successful entrepreneurs. Giving them the tools and the resources to start their second, their third, their fourth, and their fifth. Uh, so some of us, uh, some people ask, so what's it actually like to be in Catapult? Uh, so we have two types of uh, students. We have founders. Founders are students that actually have a startup idea that they're trying to get off the ground. The other component, which is actually 80% of our cohort, are called free agents. They don't have a startup idea, but they want to join an existing startup idea and get fundamental, like, hands-on experience of what it's going to be like to get a startup off the ground. Um, our program takes place over three months typically from a Thursday to a Sunday. Uh, for us, it kicks off with our first session in Chicago. And there we focus really on like, how do we use empathy to find the problem? How do we make our first iteration on a prototype and then go out into the market? Then users go back to um, their local markets and talk to different users and customers to get feedback on their prototype. And then they come back to San Francisco where they they test out that prototype. All right, we got all this great feedback. Now, how do we integrate it into another MVP? And then it moves into the final phase where we try to get traction, and it culminates with a demo day in New York City. And that's where you, you pitch to different venture capitalists, angel investors, entrepreneurs, not only to, to try to figure out, hey, could I you know, get some additional funding, but more importantly, to try to find the, the human capital, the resources such as connections, partnerships, to say, like, what does the next four months look like with my company? And so, you know, to know Catapult is to know our students uh, and your peers. So I wanted to kind of just go through some of the students that have come through Catapult really quickly, just kind of show you, like, how cool some of these high school students really are and the ideas that they have. Our first is Henry Belcaster. He had this idea to launch a vitamin company with a one-for-one -one model. You buy one, and we give one away. He didn't have a product at the beginning. But he was able to do an Indiegogo campaign where he raised over $8,500 and he was able to do his initial prototype. And he was able to deliver 11,000 meals to people that were starving overseas. He's now selling online and structured a partnership with Whole Foods where he's going to distribute things in the Midwest in the upcoming months. Really exciting to see what he did and he had no money at the beginning. So that's a really cool example of a minimum viable product. Second is Joyce. She's a 16 year old from Southern California. And she had this idea when she was 14 to start bedazzling phone cases for her friends. That then switched to like cool patterns and shirts for her friends. She now has a store called Wild Daisy. If you go to shopwilddaisy.com, she has over 100,000 followers on Instagram. She's going to make over half a million dollars this year. She's just 16. So when she came to us, she's like, I want to launch a new product line. We're like, how about bath bombs? How about bath and beauty? And within three hours, they put a splash page on their website as their minimum viable product without any, any inventory, just to see if people would bite. And they did. And now this is one of the highest margin products that they have on their website. With Mohammed, he's from Toronto. He had this idea to um, build a drone. Not the drone that you get at Radio Shack, but he patent pending built this drone. And what it does, if you can see it, it can carry a 50 pound payload after disaster situations. So the problem with disasters is most people actually die afterwards because aid can't get to them. So what this does, when you compare it with the cost of buying a helicopter, you can make a thousand of these drones and they can all fly at once to different locations with aid for just the amount of people that need it. It's a really, really cool idea. He won our demo day in Chicago uh, last spring. Mukanda. He had this passion uh, for solving a problem around hearing aids and hearing devices. His grandfather lived in rural India, where it was really expensive to go to a doctor to get tested. And what he was able to do is he created a hearing test and a hearing aid all in one device for under $100. It was incredible. It took him over two years to develop. He was most recently featured on CNN. It's really, really exciting. He's going to be coming out with his final prototype in the next year. And then Shreya, 
Now, when we talked about free agents, Shreya was actually a free agent the first year. And in the program, she came back for a second year, actually one demo day, with her idea around Camp SciGirl, which took high school girls to teach middle school girls how to code. And then lastly, Micah, who was also a free agent, he just dropped out of Cornell, raised a quarter of a million dollars as a sophomore to create this. Anyone want to take a, a guess at what this is? Very similar to Roomba. So it's a Roomba that's a supercomputer. So this is a vacuum cleaner uh, that is meant to work 365 times a year, uh, 10 hours a day at hotels. And so he is busy building this. It's really exciting. And so it's been cool to see what a free agent can do with that in the, the mindset and those tools that he learned at Capital. Um, so why you? Why, why, why is this something that I'm excited about? Why am I here tonight? Well, I, I fundamentally believe that students, um, startups, uh, and these ideas fundamentally have the opportunity to change cultures and to shift how we view the world and to solve some of the world's most pressing problems. And we exist to propel that possibility in young people. And I think your generation specifically is going to be charged with solving some really, really big problems. Um, and, you know, I, I found some interesting stats I wanted to share with you. Um, in less than four years, seven million jobs will be lost due to automation. Now, this stat I love the most. One third of people that graduate from college actually use their college degree. It takes the pressure off a little bit, right? And lastly, in the next 10 years, 40% of the jobs in the marketplace, they project, do not currently exist right now. And why I share these statistics is because it's showing an ever-changing world where it's more important to have um, you know, tools and resources and skills based around your experience than maybe based on the book knowledge that you're learning. And we we'll really want to encourage you guys to take the time to find opportunities uh, to invest in those ideas. Um, whether it's figuring out how you want to disrupt the transportation industry, or if you're curious about how do we solve natural disasters and not make them as bad, for like maybe you want to be part of like eliminating, you know, delivering packages via truck, or maybe it's like how do we use virtual reality to increase empathy and how we relate to other people and cultures, or maybe it's you want to figure out how we can colonize different planets. Is that going to happen during your lifetime? Is that going to be because of you? So the question I want to leave you with is what problem will you solve? You know, Catapult, we're not just about the startup. We're about you, the entrepreneur. And I think there's ways that you can get started right now. You don't need Catapult. You've got great opportunities like E101. But guess what? You don't even need E101. There are ways to get started small. A few of you already mentioned a couple of really great ideas that you're implementing now. For others that might be interested, join that team. Start to implement it. Just by going through that experience here on campus, that's going to teach you a lot of great things. And then start to evaluate, what, what else could we do here? What could we do at Phillips Academy that would really make life better for other students, faculty? What might that be? Um, and so I want to leave you with that. Um, if you are interested in Catapult, if you think that it's something that, you know, is something that would be an incredible opportunity, we've made it in extremely easy. Um, all you have to do is text your email to this number. Um, and what we'll do is we uh, just launched our private application round, and um, it ends on October 3rd. And so if you shoot us an email with your, um, if you shoot us a text with your email, we'll make sure, uh, Amanda, our head of partnerships and recruitment right there, uh, we'll make sure that you get a special invitation to that round. We have both spring and summer applications open. Our big thing, we look for people that have a passion. We look for people that are curious. We don't ask for your GPA. We don't ask for your transcript. We don't really care about that stuff. We care about the things that you want to solve in this world. Uh, and so it's been, a, it's been a privilege and an honor to be able to talk with you. I want to open it up now to uh, some fun Q&A. And know with me, like, everything's fair game. Uh, I, I love doing this. I get to travel the country, getting to talk to different high school students, and it's one of my favorite things that I get to do. So um, 
Yeah, I guess we can just open it up to, to Q&A now. Sure. All right. Any questions? Sure. So I think we, so we do have people that reach out that want to, that can't do the program, whether it's um, they can't fit it into their schedule or they just don't have the resources. Um, and so, like I said right now, there's a lot of ways to just get involved. And I would say the first thing is find a problem that you're really passionate about and then start to prototype on it. And there's great resources even here that you could come in and, and start to do that. So I think anyone that doesn't have access to it, that's what I would say is start really small. I would say find the problem iterate on an idea, and then go and talk to 30 customers. And continue that process until you figure out, like, okay, what is the thing that they're actually onto? Um, so, yeah? So for ideas uh, for, the, for the program where, they do, where you do, like, three weekend sessions, how is that enough time to, like, develop the, the product? It's a great question. So that's why we do it over three months. Yeah, so the, the whole idea is you come in, it's super intense, and then you go back into your local markets and you start to talk to different customers and figure out how to get that going. So that's why we're the entire, uh, for the summer program or the, the entire summer, for the spring program or the, the entire semester, just to get that time, because it does take a lot of time. Back on the couch. How old am I? <laughs> you got to guess. Huh? Twenty-five. Twenty-four. Twenty-eight. Right. Forty-five. Twenty-four. That's good. That's good. Fifteen. Thirty-five. I'm uh, I'm thirty. I'm thirty-two. What's the oh? For? <laughs> yeah. Well, so what we recommend with that, like even with prototyping, like for your example, like an iOS, like we would say first to come out, like we've had people with, like literally we had a high school dating app that closed like 100,000 in DC funding that literally went around with post-it notes on a phone and just said, hey, will you test this out? Like 50 post-it notes and they got great user feedback and that then could influence what components they started to build. To your question about like what if they don't know how to code, learn. Like you're, you're not going to find any kind of investor that would invest in a non-technical team. And so this idea that you need a really, I mean, there are so many great resources out there. Um, and then I think another big thing about being like a, a leader and a visionary is your ability to attract other people to the project. And so I'd encourage you to maybe find a partner that's like, maybe you both don't know how to code, you're like, hey, we're going to double down, we're going to do this. We're going to hold each other accountable. I had a friend that got into a prestigious uh, incubator called Y Combinator that did that. They didn't know how to code at all and they built their first prototype. So I, I would encourage uh, a lot of people to be like, oh, we're just going to hire people to do it. You can absolutely do that. It's just um, it's not sustainable, and people are going to see through that. And there's also some really good tools out there that you can get like a minimum viable product out there that might not have full functionality, but it can get your point across to you know, give you the feedback that you need at that stage. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, awesome, that's a great question. So um, I'd say the biggest difference is uh, for Catapult, we're really a next step for students that go to those other programs. Um, and so we want to work with entrepreneurs and teams that are more developed in their idea. And then for us, it's not just about our incubator. So in about 18 months, we're going to be launching our, our accelerator program, which is for only our alumni. And it's three months full time. We actually invest in them. We're going to launch a little sm small seed fund 
And so for us, it's a much longer game plan. Like we, that's why we, we really focus on launching the entrepreneur. And so I'd say like our approach too, in the sense that we take three months to do our program instead of four weeks or five weeks, you just need time. And so we're not residential. That's also a big thing. Like you can do this program and do other things in the summer. Uh, it's not something you have to commit to for an entire time. Uh, but I'd say this is the whole idea of like we want to be, those are other programs are great introduction to entrepreneurship and they serve the needs for a residential program. What we really focus on is, all right, after you've done that program, let's come to us, because we don't cover a lot of those introductory phases. Ours is more focused on our ecosystem, so providing each team with incredible mentors to guide throughout the program. I'd say that's another big component that's different. Yeah? What's the hardest part about being an I think it changes. I think that's why I'm like, well, what was it last week? <laughs> what is it this week? Because <laughs> um, that changes. I would say overall, though, like, it just sucks making mistakes. And like, even I still make tons of mistakes, and it just really sucks. Um, and I think this idea of like, an, like a startup is a, a, a business idea in search for, of a like, repeatable, scalable business model. So it's not really even a business yet. It's in search to become one. And along the way, you're just like failing all the time. And while I've definitely built this resilience, it's still like, it's really hard um, at the end of the day. So I'd say that that's the, that's the hardest thing. Um, yeah, and then I think as a leader, when you're failing so much, to also then try to still keep up a, a, like a good attitude and a good mentality for the rest of the team is also really hard. So you don't want to be like not authentic with them, but you also like have to be like a cheerleader, like, Visionary leading them forward, so I'd say that those two paired together are really, really hard. Cool. We get one more round of applause for Jeff. <laughs> so just before everybody goes, um, there were some notepads that were handed out. The notepads have a function. The first function is. Walk around with them on campus, put them in your back pocket, record your ideas as you go around day to day. Okay, that part's cool. The other function, though, is in the very back page of the, um, the notebook, you will either see, is it a picture of a headphone? Headphones, look at that. And then a picture of a Consider this the first seed money for your first idea. It's $50 Amazon. Um, so basically, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Next week, uh, we'll do this every Wednesday night, so I hope everybody comes. Whoever got this, just come on up. Go ahead. Pizza's here. We got pizza.